Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Jackie Jacob. I'm a, a poultry extension worker at the uh, University of Kentucky, and as part of my duties, I run the, or not run, I, I coordinate the um, small and backyard flocks community of practice uh, at on e-extension, and as part of that, we do monthly webinars. This month's webinar is on avian anatomy and how to perform a necropsy. And Dr. David Frame from Utah State University will be your presenter. All yours, David. Thanks, Jackie. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And it looks like we have quite a few um, representations from around the country, uh, at least in the south and east. And um, what we're going to talk about today is probably something that not everyone would necessarily be interested in, but um, it may be something that uh, on occasion um, the, the person with a few um, chickens would want to do to give him, an idea, him or her an idea of what uh, exactly uh, might be going on in the flock. Um, I'm going to intermingle the necropsy, which is the actual autopsy of the bird and um, and the avian anatomy together so as we uh, visit the, the different parts of the bird we can talk about things um, I may wander off a little bit uh, just on things that strictly aren't um, anatomy but I think they're cool and interesting for you to know um, I'm going to assume that most of you folks have not had much uh, uh, anatomical um, skills or things like that with the, the birds as they come. So uh, if it sounds a little basic to begin with, why well, I apologize, but uh, let's get on with it and see uh, how we go. First of all, I'd just like to um, tell you a little bit about myself. I'm, I'm actually the Extension uh, Poultry Specialist for Utah State University. I um, went to veterinary school at uh, Oregon State University and uh, did um, some residency work at the University of California at Davis. And um, from there I, I went to work at a turkey operation, um, Moroni Feed Company in central Utah, and uh, saw a lot of turkeys for a number of years and then joined the, uh, the faculty of uh, Utah State University in 1998 and have been there since uh, working in mainly an extension. Um, I do have a, an assignment uh, in the diagnostic laboratory with the uh, university and I do most of the, the poultry that uh, comes in at that point. Very good. Now let's set some baselines here as we get along. Uh, the first thing is is that this little chat is, is basically to become familiar with uh, what a chicken looks like um, its anatomy how it differs a little bit from mammals and things like that um, and then how to properly open up a, a carcass in order to look at those things and uh, what I'm going to stress mainly in this presentation is what normal is um, the it's not necessary that we all understand all the um, pathology and the abnormalities within in the bird. Um, the basic objective here is to, if you become familiar enough with the normal, if something abnormal shows up, then you'll know to get a hold of your veterinarian. Um, so that's going to be the main uh, objective here. I'm just looking at the the chat box as I'm going here. If I pause a little bit to see if there's anything that uh, comes up. If any of you have questions as, as we roll along, uh, this is not a monologue. Let's, uh, let's talk about them as we come. Um, the objective is not to become a pathologist or to know all these things, but, uh, but rather when something abnormal does show up, uh, then you know that maybe you better seek some attention um, on your birds. The other thing too is, is that um, you can't really tell everything that's wrong with a chicken or 
basically any other bird just by opening it up and looking at it because a lot of diseases look the same. Uh, some diseases you just absolutely can't tell the difference. Uh, I've looked at hundreds of thousands of birds and, and there's no way that some of these diseases can, you can actually just look at a bird and say, hey, this is what it is. That's the reason why we have diagnostic laboratories. We run tests, um, bacteriology, virus tests, and others in order to find out what it is because many things do look the same. Let's start out uh, with the, the bone structure of birds. Now, the next couple of slides will be uh, some birds other than chickens. This is actually a pigeon, but uh, it does illustrate some of the things that we would like to talk about uh, today. When, when you think about birds, always think about what streamlines birds and makes them different in order to fly and in order to uh, to be lighter than than us earthlings that can't do that. Um, and the bone structure is a good example of that. Um, on the on the avian skeleton, many of the bones are, are are fused together. Where we have two bones, they may have have only one. A good example of that would be here in the in the in the leg. Um, you notice this part of the the pigeon that's the sternum okay and uh, a pigeon has a very large one i'll show you a picture of another bird that doesn't have one quite that large but uh, many of these bones are fused together and um, the reason for that is is, is uh, for rigidity in fact the, the vertebral column of birds are, are very ri rigid and when you think about um, the fuselage of a of a jet that's flying over you know that doesn't wiggle around I mean, that's very very rigid and so it is with uh, with birds. And in fact, with uh, with chickens, there's there's only one one place between T uh, the thoracic vertebrae six and seven that even has uh, any kind of articulation whatsoever. And uh, that is kind of important in some diseases that uh, affect uh, the chicken. Um, another obvious thing that we see is that there's no teeth. Um, that also lightens the load. And um, and birds, uh, most birds have a, a bony ossicle around the eye too, whereas mammals don't do, have that. Um, um, the, the sternum is important um, right here because birds breathe almost like a bellows where it comes in and out, in and out. And uh, they don't have a diaphragm, and so that's how they, they um, get the air into their uh, respiratory system and out. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But um, it, it does have a practical um, place because you, you never want to grab a, a bird, rather it be a parakeet or a chicken or anything like that, and then just wrap your, your arms around where it can't bring that sternum up and back in order to, to breathe because it, it can't do that. So, uh, so when you're holding your chickens, you know, just be aware that you can rest the breast on your, on, on your um, hands and and so forth, but just don't constrict both the back and the breast at the at the same time. Um, also, really an interesting part of the skeleton of the bird is what's called the furcula, and uh, we know the furcula as the the wishbone um, on our turkeys the, for Thanksgiving or whatever. That that bone is the only bone that is completely detached from the rest. And exactly what its function is, I'm not sure, but it has something to do. It's actually um, goes up in here, of course, and I think it gives some stabilization to the in, to the uh, inlet of the thoracic cavity or or whatever. But it um, it does fall out very easily, as we know, as we eat our our bird. The next uh, skeleton is one of a duck, and you can you can see that there's a lot of variation in avian um, osteology and uh, for instance uh, obviously uh, I'm sorry this is a goose obviously there's more um, vertebrae in a goose neck than there, there would be in a, in a chicken um, but the same general characteristics hold if if I were just to flash this thing up with nothing else most people can readily see that this is a bird of some sort uh, they do have the characteristics again no teeth the, the bill the fused bones and the rigid uh, vertebral column 
and also, of course, the sternum on this, this bird. Okay, no questions yet. Again, we look at a, a chicken. This is actually a, a, a male uh, black cochin uh, bantam. Um, this took uh, first prize in a, in a fair that I ju judged at one time. Um, but you immediately see in this picture things that distinguish anatomically a chicken from um, everything else. And of course, we have uh, the, the obvious ones are, are the comb. Um, and there's, there's different types of combs, rose combs, um, pea combs. This one has a single comb, um, as well as um, earlobes, which are also a distinguishing uh, characteristic of uh, certain breeds. Some have white earlobes, some have, have actually uh, even a turquoise colored one, and some have red, as this, as this colchin does. And then, um, of course, the, the wattles, which are paired on a bird. Um, the obvious difference here is the outer covering. We have skin and hair. Uh, chickens have skin and, and feathers. Again, what comes into play is uh, think of what is necessary to lighten um, the load on, a, on an animal and yet make it so that it can be very mobile and, and um, airworthy. And the feathers fit that bill. Um, there's, there's different shaped feathers on a, on a chicken. Um, there's, um, there's different uh, characteristics as far as width and, and rigidity goes. And um, the feathers are, are basically for protection from elements um, to be able to keep the bird warm also. And by the way, the, the way a, a, a chicken or any bird keeps warm is um, the feathers themselves aren't really the insulating factor here. The, Insulation comes from the air that's trapped in it, and that's the reason why um, it, the, the birds that uh, get in the oil slicks and so forth are in grave danger because it breaks down that ability of the feathers to trap the air correctly, and then, and then they uh, can become uh, hypothermic very quickly. I don't have a picture here. I, I should have thrown this one in, but uh, let's spend a moment on, on the feather structure. Um, why is a feather rigid the way it is? Let's take these, these um, wing feathers down here, for instance. These are actually the secondaries on the wing. Um, but uh, if you can envision a feather, and let's equate it with a tree, you have the, the trunk of the tree, which is the shaft of the feather, the main um, part going uh, through the middle, which is rigid. And off that shaft, there, there are barbs that come off, um, and they, in turn, have uh, barbules that come off of those branches, and so there would be smaller branches. And the, the way that those those uh, feathers and parts of the feathers stick together is there's little hooklets called barbicels on the end um, of the barbules that hook together, and it's sort of sort of like Velcro. And so um, that gives the feathers their characteristic shape. And in fact, some chickens, um, the silky, for instance. Um, lacks those uh, little hooklets and it, uh, it looks more like fur than it looks like feathers. And, and so uh, those feathers are extremely important to, uh, you know, for the protection. These feathers have to be replenished um, occasionally in, in, the, uh, in the male chicken, or excuse me, in the adult chicken. Um, this usually occurs once a year and there can be some minor molts during that time too, but um, uh, this molting process is the renewal and replenishing of this uh, feather covering. Um, other things that can cause uh, partial molts are brought on by stress or environmental conditions. Uh, for you that uh, may show chickens, you're very familiar with this, as you take them into a strange environment, uh, particularly this time of year and into the fall, and then uh, take them home and they um, end up molting. Sequence of molt uh, um, usually follows a pretty standard um, pattern. Um, it usually begins at the head, and then you have the neck, and then the body molt, and, and the wings. And um, it begins with the primaries. The primary feathers are the ones on the outside, and um, they're the, the actual flight feathers, the, the main flight feathers. And it, and it begins uh, sequentially from the innermost uh, to the out, outermost. And so any given chicken can be in a certain stage of molt 
um, at any time. Um, in fact, uh, this, this sequence, and the tail would be the last, but this sequence sometimes gets kind of muddled. Um, Tina asked, what is the purpose of molting for the bird? Uh, these feathers get old and uh, they get ragged and they start losing their ability to uh, protect and cover the bird correctly. And so that's the reason, just like a, uh, our dog would shed its, its fur, um, these chickens will, will shed their feathers. Uh, interestingly, some, some birds, actually the wear on those feathers is what makes them turn into different colors um, during the year, wild birds I'm talking about. And so this, this uh, weathering condition, this wearing down occurs in the chicken as well. And, and eventually they become pretty ragged and uh, eventually they uh, would fall out. Um, the, another question that's coming up is why do birds molt specifically in the fall? It, uh, it goes on with the, the physiologic pattern of, um, of production and reproduction uh, during the year. Um, they molt for a new, uh, a new coat of feathers so that they, they can begin uh, laying eggs in the spring. Molting uh, is a high energy uh, thing. It takes a lot of energy to do that. Uh, egg laying takes a, a lot of energy too. And, um, and in the ideal world, um, the, the chicken lays its eggs, of course, in the spring. It raises its, bird, its uh, chicks and then it uh, molts in the fall, gets a new set of feathers and, uh, and then it goes on uh, with, the next, uh, with the next year. All this sounds really good, but uh, we all know that chickens can molt about any time of the year, depending on what kind of stress factors occur. But generally, that's the reason why the fall is, uh, is, the, is the time for that. Okay, let's see. Um, all right, that's a little bit um, about um, the outer anatomy of the, of the chicken. Let's start getting into some of the necropsy uh, techniques and, and things like that. Uh, one of the first things that you have to remember um, when you start deciding, okay, I'm going to open these birds up and see what's going on. Um, always perform necropsies away from the flock in a protected area because you don't want to, to uh, accidentally um, aerosolize anything or, get, or transfer infection back into the into the main flock and also always wear personal protective equipment and, and the minimum amount of that would be coveralls or other clothes that are not worn around your birds and uh, buy yourself a box of exam gloves uh, disposable ones and um, and put them on and then put on some footwear that isn't uh, worn around your birds either and some people like to have a face mask on of some sort uh, particularly if there's a lot of dust or dander um, on there. And the, the actual equipment for performing a necropsy is, is pretty minimal. You just need some, some forceps, um, some um, surgical scissors of some sort, uh, tissue scissors. Uh, these are readily available um, online at uh, surgical supply companies. Uh, shears. Um, are a little harder to find, but uh, you can also find some and um, you might try a couple of different um, uh, brands or whatever uh, and find out what works best for you. Some of them um, are, uh, they actually come apart so they, they're easily washable and things like that, uh, but um, um, that's going to be your most important piece of equipment right there as far as I'm concerned. And also a sharp knife. Not, of course, knives, uh, any kind of uh, um, meat knife would be fine. Um, just keep it sharp. Keep all these things sharp because that's important and we don't want anyone um, getting cut or puncturing themselves or um, uh, at the very least you, you, you puncture your gloves and things because you're pushing too hard or trying to get, uh, get through the tissues. So um, it's not going to cost you a heck of a lot of money to, uh, to get into this. Um, okay. Suggestions on keeping them sharp. Um, Whetstones are good and you might have to practice a little bit on your scissors. Uh, I'm not the greatest scissor sharpener in the world and so I always have somebody else sharpen my scissors, but uh, 
Um, a good quality whetstone will keep your knife sharp, and um, and you can do that. You can actually sharpen scissors on those whetstones too. And I, I think there's probably some commercial scissor sharpening things. I've not tried them though. Um, so the important thing here is always wear exam gloves um, or something waterproof when you're performing a necropsy, um, just so you don't get um, fluids on you and uh, possible disease agents. There's not a lot of things that uh, chickens can give to us, but there are some, and you have to expect that uh, whatever is there is contagious to you and just keep yourself protected. And the other reason is is that it keeps the smell off your skin, and uh, some people ha don't like that smell of, um, of the carcasses as you're cutting them open. Now, take something, and even a little dish soap and water is good, but get all those feathers wetted down so you keep the dust and feathers from flying around before you start. Um, another thing that I like to use is uh, just uh, the quaternary ammonium that's uh, available uh, that they use in um, restaurants and things like that um, as a disinfectant, but uh, that also keeps the feathers from flying around too. But if you don't have any of those disinfectants, uh, plain old dish soap works really good. And um, Find a good cutting board of some sort so that when you, um, as you're cutting and your knife hits something, it hits something soft and not a metal table. You can see the metal table in this case um, behind it, but I still use a cutting board um, in order to preserve things and also it just kind of keeps everything together there for you. Um, This is probably the most important thing you can do as far as keeping your bird from, from tipping over and everything. And that's take the knife blade and cut along each side of the sternum, the keel bone right there. And then uh, just take your, your hands and pry up and back um, and get those legs flattened out. And they, they will kind of hold a, as a stand there for, your, for the rest of the, your work that you have to do. If you do that uh, correctly, uh, that saves you a lot of time um, in getting that, that bird positioned the way you want. In fact, um, there's th this is the head of the femur. That's our hip socket joint. And uh, that thing will pop right out and then just lay right flat for you. And this is on the left side. And of course, there's another on, on this side too. Um, and then it makes your job a lot easier um, from that there on. Now, um, you take the breast and retract that back off of uh, that cut right there. You might have to use the knife to flay it a little bit, but get that out of the way. In this particular uh, case, we can now see the keel bone sticking up. And uh, observe the musculature on each side of that keel bone. Um, a bird that is starving for um, some reason, either that it might have an impaction or it has an intestinal problem, it's not utilizing its food correctly or whatever, will have um, will not have a lot of muscles on that on on there, and so uh, look for that. Also, um, this is a well hydrated bird. It's it's pink, kind of reddish pink color. But if it is these um, chickens dehydrate and they don't drink for some reason. Um, that can get really um, reddened. And also, as you peel back that skin, you can, it doesn't peel back very well. So you want to get that skin out of the way before you look at anything else. And, um, and then we go on to the next thing. Oh, what I'd like to show you here is this is actually the inlet um, for the, the thoracic cavity. And there's an organ called the crop that fits right in there. And um, the crop is an organ that is used to moisten the feed and get it ready for the rest of the digestive uh, process. And so um, as you peel that skin back off the breast, you might want to be careful not to cut into that crop uh, too early, uh, particularly if it's filled with, with feed. This crop is fairly empty. But it should be uh, quite thin-walled like that. And um, there are some fungal infections and things that can get inside that crop, but this is a fairly normal looking uh, crop. Now turn the bird around after you get the, the skin off the, the breast 
And let's start working on the respiratory system first in the, in the upper part of the, the chicken before we get into the nitty gritty on in the uh, abdominal cavity. I'd like to start cutting on the right side of the chicken, uh, chicken's mouth right here and cutting down. And the reason that, that I like that for is because you, you'll, you'll usually go right down the esophagus and not cut into the trachea or the windpipe because um, uh, at least from a diagnostic point of view, we don't want to do that because there's some things that we might want, want to culture and, and things in, inside the, the trachea. So we don't want to do that. Um, and then you just continue down, slicing down, and you'll go, you'll go through the esophagus, but try not to cut that trachea if you can, can help it. And um, once all that's open, um, then you can look at the, uh, the, the, these organs. One thing that uh, I want to point out are, are there's some sinuses right here. They're called infraorbital sinuses. And uh, they have a tendency to swell up and fill with mucus and um, debris on some respiratory diseases. So make sure that uh, you might want to take the point of your knife and just poke down in there and uh, cut that open and see if there's anything in there. They normally should not have much of anything, uh, maybe just a little watery uh, fluid, but uh, not much more than that. A lot of times they're just as dry as, and clear as can be. Here's just a close-up shot of the esophagus, and of course the esophagus is where the food goes down into the digestive tract, and the trachea or the windpipe is right next to it. Now there, there's cartilaginous rings in the trachea, and that's what keeps it open. So it keeps it open as a tube uh, so that um, the air, of course, can get down there. Things you want to watch out for on that trachea is it should not have a lot of reddening to it. Uh, this has just a little bit. Um, it, it may be slightly abnormal, but not too bad. I think on the next slide we'll see uh, you cut it open. There shouldn't be a lot of mucus in there. Um, um, it should be fairly clear. You, sometimes you can see a little bit of reddening on the uh, close to those rings, but um, certainly you should not see a lot of mucus or um, even worse uh, if there's some some bloody debris type stuff that uh, occurs in there. And, um, and so this is an example of a good clean um, trachea. Okay, let's see where we're going. Okay, now we're gonna open the, the chicken up. And um, you take your knife and cut along each side of that breast, so you'd be cutting right here and right there. And then you just retract that breast back out of the way, and you can see many of these um, these organs uh, just sitting there. The first thing that you'll notice is this big dark organ. That's the liver. The heart fits right in between there. Um, and then you can just see the gizzard um, poking out uh, just underneath it. We get that breast out of the way. And, and a trick that will help you out a lot is um, how do I get into those organs. Well, what you want to do is you want to take your finger and just go along the edge right here and you'll be breaking some air sacs down and I'll show you those air sacs in a minute. But uh, get all those membranes broken open and then you can just retract that right over and it'll open right up for you. Like that. So now that pretty much opens up the, the cavity and you don't have to fish around for uh, a lot of things. And if you do that consistently, everything will be in the same place for you all the time. Um, so once the cavity is open, uh, the next thing we want to do is start examining um, the organs inside. I've got them marked here for you. Um, let's talk about the respiratory system of the bird be to begin with. Um, the lungs are situated deep inside the rib cage, um, one on the left side and there's another over here that we can't see. Um, and they're, they're very non-expansive. So some things that are different from mammals on the um, avian respiratory system is, number one, those lungs are not expansive. Well, what happens is that they have air sacs. And you can see this, this kind of filmy thing right here. Um, that is an air sac. Um, there's actually four pairs of air sacs, um, plus one that's not paired in a chicken. And when a chicken breathes, the, the air goes down into these air sacs, and, and, and then from there it goes, goes into the lungs. Uh, there's some that, that might get into the lung as they breathe, but a lot of it goes into the air sacs and then um, shoots back into the lung. 
the lung is not like a like our lungs, where it's like a balloon that expands and contracts and everything like that. Uh, these air sacs and the movement of the, the sternum going up and down in a bellows effect is what brings the air back and forth um, through those lungs. Now this air sac is a little abnormal, and uh, I put this in here on purpose because so you can see it, because an air sac in general is just as clear as can be, and you can't uh, hardly see that. But they're very, very important in um, in in breathing of the of the birds. Uh, the other situation with air sacs are is that they're very non-vascular. They don't have a lot of ability to get things out of them, and so in really dusty conditions or under irritating conditions like a lot of ammonia in the coop, um, these air sacs can become inflamed very quickly and cause some, some problems for the bird. Uh, we see the heart up here. Um, the avian heart is uh, larger than mammals re relative to the total body mass. Um, it does have uh, the same number of chambers, but it has to pump a lot of blood fast uh, avian uh, species and chickens will have a, a very high blood pressure um, and sometimes uh, also their vessels are not quite as strong as, um, as a, a mammal's. bleed out inside, a hemorrhage inside. This occurs more with turkeys than it does with chickens, but uh, uh, they do have softer vessels and, uh, and they do have high blood pressure. And they also have a high pulse rate. Uh, you know, the typical chicken will have 200 to 400 beats per minute. Uh, you know, and you compare that with ours, which is what, uh, 60 to 70 beats per minute. And, uh, and so that heart has to work very, very hard. Um, we see in this particular one also um, the spleen. The spleen is an image. There might be some blood storing capacity of a spleen too that, that helps out. Um, the thing I want to show out on this, show you on this one is this spleen is abnormally large. Uh, this chicken um, is not a normal. There's a, there's a few things that I wanted to show you, and the spleen was one, and the air sac. And talk about um, um, some of the other parts here. And um, Hard like that, then then there might be something wrong um, with it there. This is what where the egg yolks come from, and I thought think it's really interesting that every egg yolk, every ovum that a chicken is going to produce in its lifetime as a layer is all there present at the time that that bird is hatched. And uh, in a few minutes I'm going to show you a laying hen and you can see just what happens to that. Um, this little dark organ right here behind to the side of the ovary and this is part of it also there's three lobes to it and it's the kidney. And there's, there's a kidney on the left side and there's a kidney on the right side and um, the excretion from the avian kidney comes out as uric acid, which is a very light concentrated form of nitrogen, um, and it's much lighter than urine, which mammals produce. Again, this is an adaptation to lightness. You know, we start looking at reasons why uh, the birds are so mobile and so able to fly, and that's that um, the uric acid. equivalent to our urinary tract excreting urine. In this case, it's uric acid instead. Um, talked about the ovary there. Um, on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit um, 
about the digestive system. Actually, let's kind of go back on this one. And I uh, don't know where my pointer went. actually excretes hydro, uh, the uh, hydrochloric acid and the pepsin and things that are stomach gizzard. and the gizzard is the grinding organ of the bird it's sort of like the, the teeth I guess and it's always kind of um, um, Is, but obviously it works pretty well because with, with two main muscles and um, this grinds the feed inside and, and uh, oftentimes if they pick up little pieces of rock or calcite um, they can uh, that helps because it just kind of grinds Um, you, you've noticed that uh, uh, there's kind of a and that cuticle is what um, is the tough part. down in this area and I'll, I'll show you a little more about those uh, in a minute. The total intestinal system of the, the chicken. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this. Uh, this would be the esophagus coming into the proventriculus and we know that's a journey into the um, rest of the digestive tract. Um, this little guy right there, um, it, it's an organ that's filled with green fluid and that's actually filled with bile and this is the gallbladder and um, and so th this is uh, kind of important to look at as you're cutting open the birds because sometimes if a chicken is off feed that gallbladder will be big and uh, just full and it, it, because it hasn't emptied its bile into the into the uh, digestive tract like it should. Um, the duodenum is the first part of the intestine after the the gizzard. Um, the the bird's pancreas is actually in that du duodenal loop, and I forgot to put the word pancreas up there, but uh, that's actually found within there. And of course, that uh, is important for a number of uh, reasons and. Insulin is one of them, but it also puts the digestive uh, fluids into the in, into the intestine. So as the food the food works its way up into the small intestine, some people will divide this into different uh, parts. The um, the of the of the is a little knob sometimes you can see and I don't have a good uh, view of it right here but it's called Meckel's diverticulum and that's actually where the yolk sac fits in on the chick and so after all the yolk is absorbed that little uh, Meckel's diverticulum uh, stays right there and uh, and that's kind of the mid section and, and so from a diagnostic standpoint that's what I like to use because if I want a portion of the mid small intestine I will find that Meckel's diverticulum and then try to to uh, cut things out, unless of course there's pathology in other places too. Um, the large intestine is 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 pretty short. Um, it comes down, and there's two interesting organs. Um, each one is called a cecum. Together they're called ceca, but these are blind passages um, that are actually quite important in the chicken. Um, the ceca act as uh, reabsorption of uh, water. Um, as it's coming down through the digestive tract 
And so if they're not uh, functioning properly, then you, you can also get some diarrhea. Um, the, from As a diagnostician, Sika are really a, a pain in the neck because they you can get a lot of diseases in those uh, organs, uh, coccidiosis and uh, blackhead and a few other things too. Uh, <clears throat> what is the purpose of the crop in the digestive system? It looks like Jackie's already uh, answered that. So, why do they get impacted crops? Uh, interesting. Uh, first of all, if they eat a lot of undigested material, um, undigestible material, such as uh, long grass and things like that, it just doesn't go through and, and it can uh, cause an impaction. And once the crop starts getting distended, it has a tendency to to drop down a little bit, and then it then it makes it even harder for that uh, crop to empty. Um, a, a problem that I've seen um, quite frequently is um, that uh, the impacted crop will occur if uh, if a chicken hasn't um, consumed water. Uh, it consumes a lot of feed, then it consumes. sink it'll swell up and and uh, can't get out uh, so uh, and also there is a genetic predisposition predisposition to uh, get a, a dropped crop type thing where it gets impacted too but uh, but generally it's uh, just under indigestible material or or too much in there and then it swells up um, okay so now um, We've talked about the cecum. The cecum come down to a junction right here. That's, it's called the ileocecal junction. Now, that's not important to know that word, but what is important is there, there's um, parts of the immunologic uh, system right here, the lymph, um, lymphoid tissues, and they're called um, cecal tonsils. And uh, in some diseases, these cecal tonsils will get really um, red and enlarged, and uh, they're pretty serious diseases if that's the case. Uh, but um, uh, from a diagnostic standpoint, we, we like to look at those sequel tonsils. Can chickens get something similar to hardware disease and ruminants? You bet they can. Uh, um, they get a, If they consume a, a piece of wire, I've seen wire go right through the gizzard. Um, the muscle on that gizzard is extremely strong, and it can push things um, through and cause um, punctures and then you can get uh, peritonitis and all kinds of uh, problems in there. So it's usually a sharp object that, that does that. Uh, um, I've seen nails and in, in wires mainly because they're stout enough that they seem to, to go through. So that is a, is a possibility. It's not that common, but it does occur. Oh, one thing I want to mention too is uh, as we come down to the end of the digestive tract. Now this is called the cloaca and, and uh, that's the common um, outlet of um, the urinary system, the digestive system, and also our, our reproductive system that we'll see in a minute. But there is an, an organ called the bursa of Fabricius and that's, an, that's a, um, a lymphoid organ um, that occurs just on the top of that thing and it's, it's really important uh, because it gets exposure to um, um, Different types of uh, what we call antigens or things, and then it'll produce it'll produce uh, lymphoid uh, cells that fight against it and other things. Um, interesting. Yeah, you might have heard of B cells and, and T cells. The, the word B or the letter B actually comes from the type of lymphocytes that are formed in this bursa fibricius in in the bird. So um, historical point there. Okay, um, female reproductive system. This is where the rubber hits the road here for, for most of us. Uh, the first point I want to make on this thing is here's is what? That is the spleen. That is more of a, of a normal color of a spleen. Uh, this chicken, this hen was in production um, and uh, notice that the, that, that small granular looking ovary in the pullet, now as we look at this hen, you can see that those those little granular things are, are starting to form what are called ova, and that's actually the egg, egg yolk, basically, um, that will drop down into the um, oviduct. And um, 
the oviduct will take up a lot of space within the abdominal cavity um, and normally um, the well the left oviduct is the only functional one in chickens as I was looking at this slide here late, or earlier today I noticed something that um, right down in here is actually the cystic right oviduct um, that thing does not um, become into a full-blown organ like this but oftentimes you'll see um, a lot of water and fluid in, in something that you don't really know have one and it's fairly common I've seen it uh, a lot and uh, probably more common than, than what uh, you might think and um, uh, the reason the chickens lay eggs obviously think again about the um, efficiency of mobility and flight um, if they had to take a, a uh, offspring uh, nine months or five months to term and then deliver it and everything what would that do to the the, the hen and that's and her ability to survive um, laying eggs actually gives her the opportunity to to raise young and yet still be light enough and uh, uh, to get get away find the food and do what needs to be done and so I, that's another one of those things and uh, uh, as you look at avian anatomy it just amazes you just how how interesting it is when it comes to things like that uh, this is the reproductive tract of the hand that I've I've taken out to, to show you a few things this is the ovary these are individual each one is an ovum and this will eventually become the egg yolk and um, uh, these are released from the ovary and come down into the infundibulum which is kind of a cone shaped uh, funnel shaped thing that that egg has to drop down into um, hens ovulate about 20 minutes after laying a, an egg so once once the egg is laid um, 20 minutes later uh, one of these um, ova will be will be released to fall down into the infundibulum uh, that's well and good but oftentimes um, that misses the cone and, and falls into the abdominal cavity somewhere a lot of these are just reabsorbed without any problems but um, uh, occasionally they'll get down inside the body cavity and it causes a terrific uh, inflammatory reaction and uh, it's called egg yolk peritonitis and um, uh, chickens um, can die from this and it, it causes a, sometimes a secondary bacterial infection usually an E. coli infection um, that occurs um, at that point so um, in in theory this should occur uh, but sometimes it doesn't but once that yolk is released down into the um, infundibulum um, incidentally if, if you have if you're raising um, birds a flock for uh, fertility for reproduction um, this ovum has to be fertilized within three minutes after it's released and um, so it, it's quite interesting because there's, there's sperm cells that that are sperm uh, organs down here that um, store the sperm from the rooster and uh, it has to travel up there within 20 minutes there's also some sperm storage glands up in, in this area too that can fertilize but uh, it's got to be fertilized within uh, three minutes uh, uh, very interesting once it's in there it goes down into this part of the um, reproductive tract which is the uh, where the albumin is put in and um, and of course there's two types of albumin on an, on an egg uh, there's the thin and the, the thick and the thin and then as it goes down in here it'll spend about uh, three hours in the magnum area getting that onto it then it goes down into the infant tibulum, and this is where the plumping occurs and uh, also the um, membranes are put on um, prior to getting the eggshell on and so it'll spend about an hour and a half in this area and then it goes down into the shell gland down here and it, there's not an egg in there uh, unfortunately I would have liked to have one in there to show you but um, that's where it spends the majority of its time 20 to 21 hours in this uh, shell gland area and it'll eventually lay down up to two grams of calcium the 
for 27 hours um, between eggs, um, you know, between laying of eggs. And, um, and so that's the reason why hens will start laying early in the morning and then they start laying a little bit later each day. And then eventually sometimes uh, if they're laying too late in the afternoon, they may miss a day or, or whatever. That's where you get your 90% production into. Um, so uh, let's see, the other thing that um, I wanted to show you on, on this is that here's a close-up of an actual ovum that hasn't um, hasn't broken out into the infundibulum yet. There's there's a place that doesn't have a lot of um, capillaries on it, a lot of blood supply, and that's where it, this membrane actually breaks, and that's where the speck of blood will happen um, as this stigma area is breaking, and one of those little capillaries will will break. Um, let's see, we have a question here. We know there are different laying rates for different chicken breeds. What is the maximum number of yolks a chicken might have? What percentage turn into eggs, uh, misfires, or other non-egg results? And what breeds are going to have high numbers of yolk availability? Um, all I can tell you is that there's thousands of those little, of these ova inside rudimentary ova inside the chick that's hatched and and they're never going to be able to use all those eggs um, egg yolks um, in their laying cycles in a in their lifetime and um, and so there's there's they're all available um, certainly different breeds will lay at a greater rate than others the mediterranean breeds such as leghorns of course will will lay at a tremendous rate to 90 um, to 95% um, at the peak of their cycle. Some of the heavier breeds may not lay quite that uh, that number of, but you never have to worry about the number of ova ever expiring because there's more, many more than can possibly um, be laid in the lifetime of a, of a hen. Okay, so now we literally come to the end here. Um, as I mentioned before, the this is called the cloaca. And um, it is the common outlet uh, for the urinary system, the uh, digestive system, and also um, where the eggs are laid. And um, they do come out of different uh, different uh, areas of tracks in the in the system of the bird, but uh, they all end up there. Now, um, also it's called a vent. Thank you, Tina. Um, the cloaca or the vent, and. Uh, this is kind of an indication um, of if the, the hen is laying or not, too. Uh, there's a lot of other things we don't have time to go into, in, obviously, in this presentation. But uh, a good, plump, uh, moist-looking vent um, is one of the indications that uh, the bird is laying, and also that, it, that it's healthy. So as we review here, um, hopefully we can become familiar with the basic anatomy of the chicken. And there's a lot of things we haven't covered, uh, probably not necessary in a in, a, in a, an hour basic course like this. Uh, um, we could could have looked at the brain and um, uh, some of the lobes and the characteristics there. We could have looked at uh, the eye. The eye is interesting because the eye is 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 huge compared to a lot of mam mammalian eyes as far as the skull goes. And um, then um, hopefully. You can open up a, a carcass and, and at least be familiar enough to know, okay, this is where the organs are. And uh, if you look at a number of those and, and enough of them, uh, you somewhat become familiar with what normal is. Um, Judith, Judith asks, if a carcass has been frozen, how will necropsy be affected? Sometimes there's a little bit of a color change in some of the organs, but generally speaking, you can thaw them and then um, also look and they look uh, similar, but uh, I guess from my experience, they have more of a reddened look to them, uh, some of the, um, the organs. And the, the problem with freezing a carcass and then having it diagnostically looked at, is some, it's not the ideal for histopathology uh, to look at the, the tissues under the microscope. Um, are Merrick's lesions easy to see? I'm glad you brought that up because no, unless you're familiar enough with um, 
with the, the anatomy to be able to see that. Let's just go back really quickly to answer that question. Um, I want to show you right here. That muscle right there, you can peel back, and then there will be a, a, a nerve underneath it. And also within the carcass, right by the kidneys, uh, that nerve will continue on, and you can look at where it branches into different areas. Um, in, a, in a lot of Merrick's disease cases, um, those nerves will appear yellow. They'll, they'll appear swollen. Um, they don't have a characteristic striation to them and everything, but unless you know what you're looking for, um, you, you may not be able to see it. In fact, some of this is, is uh, microscopically, and that's the reason why you would have to actually have histopathology done on some of those. But in a lot of cases, uh, uh, those, those nerves do look abnormal. Um, okay, let's get back. Wrap this thing up. So, your home necropsy is never a substitute for professional um, opinions on things, but uh, it may give you a little bit of an idea of uh, what's going on. Again, it's not for everyone, um, but uh, uh, we that are a little more curious than, than some might like to do those type of things. And um, contact your local veterinarian or the poultry diagnostic laboratory uh, for further advice on these things. Uh, one thing you might want to do is check with your Department of Ag too. They have uh, a lot of resources and will be able to direct you to the right place. Thank you, David. That was a really good presentation. I hope everybody Thanks. enjoyed it. Um, there were some questions about future webinars. If you want to type into the chat box if you have something in particular that you're interested in seeing. Um, otherwise, uh, some of the ones that we have coming up uh, in September, we're going to start looking at winter care of backyard poultry flocks to get you ready for the oncoming winter, especially if it's as bad as it was last year. Uh, October's is not on the uh, um, website yet, but it will be on processing of poultry for those that are interested in getting ready for uh, doing a turkey for Thanksgiving or whatever. Um, November will be on starting a small commercial operation. We haven't um, had a lot of uh, time to schedule that particularly, but we're, that's what we're looking at. Uh, December, for those that work with kids, especially 4-H, we'll be looking at coaching a 4-H avian bull team. And then in January, we have a specialist from the uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention talking about salmonella and backyard poultry uh, because of the different... Um, outbreaks of salmonellosis that we had this year, this summer, related to backyard flocks. Um, as I said at the beginning, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, all the new and past webinars um, that you uh, can look up on uh, extension.org slash poultry, and uh, you'll be able to um, see what recordings and you'll be able to uh, see what's coming up. Again, if you want to check us out on Facebook, facebook.org slash poultry extension, uh, that is uh, another way to find out what's happening uh, with our small and backyard flocks. Um, there was a question about kidneys. I don't think we discussed kidneys, but they're more than pea size, right, David? Yes. In fact, uh, we talked a little bit about the three lobes. Uh, they, they were the dark organs uh, on the side, um, uh, okay. on each side. Uh, okay. So, uh, any more questions? Just type them in the chat box before Dave leaves. We we are quickly running out of time, um, but we are. Uh, what would make them small? 
there's there's the top lobe of the kidney, and there would be a center one, and they're down. They're very large organs, actually. What would make them small? Anything that would be a dehydration or? Uh, yeah, sometimes they get gout in there too, but usually that makes them enlarged and and um, makes them more of a pale colored. Um, but that's a fairly frequent thing is is a gout problem in there. Um, uh, one thing that we didn't go obviously we're not going into pathology, um, but uh, there was a question on prolapse and and egg binding, and that would be a very interesting subject. Uh, egg binding typically is caused um, in 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 chickens by a imbalance of, of the calcium phosphorus in the blood and so it's not so much the egg gets caught in there it's, it's just that the smooth muscles can't can't push it out sometimes and that's the majority of the egg binding in in chickens um, and some of the other pet birds and things it may be other causes okay. uh, we are out of time um, thank you very much David for uh, doing the presentation for us you did an excellent job um, and as I said, this webinar is being recorded, and if you want to go back and review it, or if you want to tell your friends about it, uh, you can just go to extension.org slash poultry, and uh, you'll get to be able to watch it. Thanks, David. Thank you very much. It was my We're pleasure. We're finished, Suzanne, if you want to turn us off.